Well, thank you as always to Barbara and Wyatt for bringing us all together. Um, thank you to the great staff who um, never stops. And I want to say a special thank you to my partner in crime, Sidney Wade, and our wonderful workshop. Glad we're all able to do this. I have a new book out. That's what it looks like. It's called One Man's Dark. And I'm going, I'm going to I frame my reading by reading one poem from the book and then a bunch of poems that I've written since I was here last summer, and then close with a final poem from the book. <clears throat> this is called Number Nine Wire. I go down close, I blank, to the first page of a thing, like the hank of a wire I hung over a nail in the barn. I've twisted the origins of the wire, and it's likely Mr. Key, a careless and melancholy long before my time. It's likely he is the one who left the wire, perhaps not long enough to hitch a gate. But people have their visions, don't they? Where everything inside has purpose and nothing is cast out because belonging to the vision is the vision. I've seen a hive of bees work mountain laurel trees. I've seen them visit every blossom and thought to myself, so must it be in heaven. The other man from the old days I think about, Sylvanus Shade, took a wild rose cane and bent it to a shepherd's crook. And when he died, they stuck the crook in the ground and roses bloomed upon it. Tresses of roses tumbled down as he had claimed they would. He said there was no end to anything, not even death would be an end. His daughter, Sylvie, made a teacher of the schoolmarm type, and she taught Mr. Key back when the roads were traces and tracks along the streams. I've seen the way he made a four marked backwards on a barn beam. And he must have learned the philosophy that disarray is beautiful and even a piece of wire is rare, though what a man could use it for is more uncommon still and endless. So he unknowingly taught me, just as careless with my numbers and with melancholy of my own, who loves rose canes and bees and the sweet of mountain laurel trees, and all the unseen underneath. The people who had this place before it came to me were the graves, but the man who built the barn was Mr. Key. I've heard he was a troubled man. Oh, he was clever with his hands, but sorely troubled otherwise, like a man who's wandered out of a book. And these are poems I began writing immediately after leaving Swanee last summer. This is an inspiring community. <clears throat> Three old mountain women. They were country beauties in their time, but I knew them when they were old wearing straight, dark dresses below the knee, absolved of passion what little there had been, because the women I'm thinking of, my kin, were practical, mothers of children, the rearing, the little patch of land, and their countenance, and their, excuse me, mothers of children, the rearing, the little patch of land, and their continuance, what they were born to, a hard place, a people. Above all, they were gardeners, green down to their being roots, and roots in the spreading ground below their calm countenance, 
when sitting in a straight-backed chair, a voice prompted them to tell a tale, and then they told it plainly, aware, I sometimes thought, of what effect hearing the tale would have on me. But now I think I merely needed a voice, a voice suspended in the air. Well, I declare, and together they gave it to me. Anybody know about moonflowers? This is called moonflowers. <laughs> moonflowers, you people who care to know, are blooming now below the bright moon, tilting their white trumpets, trumpeting nothing in eerie, serene silence, save the crickets and their fiddle tunes, fiddling back and forth and a whirring, whistly sound, almost a ring, as if all of this has a bell behind it or the resonant echo of a bell. Has someone with a key wound the clock of beauty ticking here? Wouldn't I be better off dreaming terrible things? A woman I knew used to wind a kitchen clock. It ticked me to sleep and then awake when as a boy I stayed with the woman who was my mother's mother. Now she was not beautiful. She had been, but something took her beauty away. Some kind of fate kept coming for her. One time she told me, and that depression just kept coming, meaning they went from little to nothing, little by little, until nothing was left. Her voice was ragged with the pang, a cold, unflagging misery. A lot of people were helpless then. That was a certain kind of nothing. The nothing trumpeted by flowers, by these bells of moonflowers raised to the moon, nearly full, abiding, is a balm of Gilead nothing. Were that ragged, broken woman still alive, I'd show this nothing to her and hope my joy to show it would prove my love for her who loved me back mysteriously. I'd ask the moon to bloom over the scene in which I say I love you to her. And the boyishness of that would not impede the earnest poetry of seeking love and finding it in a woman who suffered more than most. Many of you uh, are missing our good friend Tony Early. He was often up here on the mountain. And um, this is a poem I wrote for him. Last fall it took me forever and ever and ever, and it's still not right. But when you're trying to match up with a guy like Tony, you're always going to fall short. <clears throat> this is called The Tall Book. I've determined the quiet beauty of things is what I hearken to, the grace of a papery butterfly tipping over the purple frill at the tops of ironweed, the field splayed up the hill and misty, the end of summer. Nothing like an understatement to inspire, or rain of flood in the mind to leave it glimmering and deep. It's been a pretty good day. I've worked in the pastoral sense under the sun and felt the heat, the idle shrug of knowing the work is never done to make the world alive and living, to make the mind's revealing vision tremble and shake itself alive as a butterfly wriggling out of its sticky round domain. I can tell I'm dreaming my way into something, 
drifting along with the pleasant dream and the voice of the dream telling it in a sonorous sound and rhythm I like. Some of the words I used to hear and say to myself over and over have risen up, playing by ear. That's how I've always gone about it, imagining the sound of a voice and hearing in it, despite the clear authority, some pleasure, affection. Early on, I heard a lot of wrong words, the garbled language, and words put to inventive use. I was often told to quieten down in school. Or an old man would say at night, it's quite all right, and stare into a distance he seemed to see the other side of, where silence lived, the sole ghost of the other country. And there were mystical tones and forms I liked to hear. Quit your meddling. That sounded like the name of a man who lived in a tall tale <laughs> and drank a pond of water every morning and picked his teeth with a cedar tree or tamed a pair of rattlesnakes to keep his britches heisted up. He was 27 feet tall and played a fiddle made from a coffin. <laughs> heisted up. Quit your meddling. What kind of bride would marry him? I liked to make him real to me and follow him to the quietened place. Sometimes thinking about a word and the voice that said it moves me to tears. A scalded dog, the reaching pole, the wavingest man that ever was. It could have been that Quicho Medlin and his woman had a pair of sons, untelling Medlin and woesome Medlin but called them tell and some for short. They were a practical tribe like Moses or Noah, Old Testament folks who wandered wherever no one else was at. So far up a holler they had to pipe in sunlight, and the ground was so puny they fertilized the fence posts to keep them stuck. <clears throat> but tell and some were kindly shy, and one day they said to quit your meddling, Pappy, we ain't hardly fit to be a no tall tale. We're shy. And we're pert near civilized, and we ain't eat nobody yet, nor swallowed up the clouds, nor clomb a vine to the yonder side of heaven. The father calmly raised a brow, prompting his shavers now to think. Reckon I could gnaw on a leg to see if I like eating people, said Tell. And there's a passel of vines all over this territory, said some. I figure there's one worth climbing up. Quicho Medlin twisted his whiskers around like a rag and pondered his chaps. I gone his boys, you've got to wait. There's a heap of time in a tall tale that don't get counted for and passes as quiet as a river in the shade. A feller has to sleep and set himself on a stump and see what's what. But then with a clap of thunder, he's off on something dramatical and the clouds go to making furrows in the sky and pretty soon a witch shows up. The tail comes back and follows on. You pups will have tall tails aplenty. Bangers if you ain't in one now. You might even find yourselves set down one day on the leaves of the tall book right there aside of old Jack. As quiet as a river in the shade. I gave those words to Quicho Medlin. And in my mind, as he said them, he blew a tuft of whiskers out of his mouth. I had him fashioned as a man who'd let a wilderness grow on his face. A man who couldn't read a lick. And now he's got a tale of his own. I like the rattlesnake suspenders. I also like the river, curled like a snake asleep on a branch in the scene and the rhythm slinking through the words in time with the silent, lazy river, the symbols, the archetype, the stillness, up there in the misty, hazy hills with the river wandering below. Miss Hazel Mosley, 
that was her name, the teacher who told me to quieten down. She had to say it many times. I remember her heavy black shoes and the clod-hopping sound she made clomping across the room, dots to mark the quiet she required. She was short, below five feet, and as stout as a brimming coffee pot. You have to keep the language alive. That's something I've learned from listening. I've also learned from watching the world, a butterfly completely yellow, a pale yellow the color of butter, and the butterfly bending over the purple top of ironweed in a shaggy field on the side of a hill. The beauty of what is and the words for it. I find it all bewildering and filled with love, a voice hearing itself caught in a moment of grace or a moment of quiet delight, delight. The task. The hill is crooked against the sky as if the horizontal line were torn upward and jaggedly, rough shapes in the foreground drooping inward, leaving nothing defined, no edge from rounded thing to thing, that is, from exhausted treetop to vine-choked scrub to weeds, blown blossoms, stiff stalks, yellowing dingy splotches dappled with impressionistic tinges of red. You'd think a sensitive painter were here to make an incoherent vision a vision to explain the world. That's too dramatic, too heavy-handed for me. The vision comes in and out of view because it's alive. It's moving, even images of death are moving in it, and images of life. Blue jays, silver from underneath, provide the paradox of order, connecting one invisible point to another out of view. No one can see it all. The end is vague, the beginning is a mist. That is, ironically, a task of art, to stand between the unknown ends and make the line believable. And what, O oh universe, am I? The one to let the line pass through? I mean, one of the ones in the line? This poem references an American poet named Archibald MacLeish, noted for getting Ezra Pound sprung from St. Elizabeth's Hospital, among other things. This is called Mad Face MacLeish. A thought or two about a thing I find curious and admire from a great distance you could say the distance of ignorance. Being not in the know is sometimes pleasant. That can apply to many things, but I'm talking about painting. I like to look at paintings even though, as a heathen, my mouth hangs open in front of one. I like to see what someone can imagine what the mind can do, and then how the mind teaches the hands to move in tiny motions. It's like seeing the quilt and then seeing closer the stitches. Very true in a crazy quilt, the single leaf defining the tree. But I can't get it in my head why so many people in paintings are looking out with a mad face. This is especially true of men from the Renaissance who were dukes and earls. 
Who wants to live hundreds of years with a mad face staring back from the dead world, eternally mad? It's strange to capture that in art. But the Renaissance was short on fun. <laughs> People were learning things and also dividing up the world and sailing their big ships into history. It's caused me to wonder why they bothered with the mad face routine. Maybe the mad face was just in fashion. People who weren't that powerful could have the look of importance if a person had a gigantic painting of himself with a big mad face. <laughs> the look of tenderness was later, I guess. But I don't really know. The look of someone falling asleep on dewy blue-green grass. On a similar note, I can't explain the presence of a thick collection of poems I have by the late American poet Archibald MacLeish. The book with a faded purple cover is just sitting there on the shelf. I've read it in nibbles, but some of the longer poems I confess I haven't gotten to. MacLeish is practically a fossil, an old idea of what poetry could be that, in its time, was new. But now it sounds tattered and stiff, a little forced and unconvincing. He was trying too hard to be a poet. A lesson there in falling short, and falling shorter and shorter in time. But the man had a warm human spirit, and I admire it. He thought the world was going to change. He believed in art. But it's hard to notice lasting art in the kingdom of immediacy. That's how I think of the world sometimes, although I cringe to hear it, the kingdom of immediacy. It's just a pose the clang of something bitter to say. It's like a mad face staring out of the poem. I believe in art, but only to a point. It's a way of being in the world. There's a freedom in it I enjoy, and I keep the mad face out most of the time. But there's freedom, too, in someone singing herself to sleep on dewy blue-green grass beneath a tree whose upper branches disappear in fog. That isn't art. It's pleasant to imagine such a scene, but I don't think it's art. It's a sweet little girl I dream about in my own eternity, a hope that has come to live in the world, my part of it at least my kingdom of fog and trees and glittering grass. This is a poem I wrote for Wendell Berry, who was my professor 28 years ago. 27, something like that. <clears throat> I did not distinguish myself in his class, <laughs> and I've been trying to make amends for it ever since. <clears throat> this is called Essay on Romantic Poetry. By romantic, I don't mean like people going out on a date and drinking a lot of wine, enough to inflame their passions or spur desire to flutter and rise like sap in a tree in early spring, and pretty soon the danger of doing the you-know-what indeed pops up. I'm leaning my meaning toward the tree. The romantics were really into nature. I mean, it's like nature was a god to them, and all they wanted to do was walk in the woods and write poems about the woods and beautiful things, such as birds and other natural stuff. None of them wanted to be rich, and they were against society, the really bad parts anyway, like slavery and anything that degraded nature or was against it, including the absence of compassion, 
which if you think about it is still a problem in the world today. But that's another essay, I guess. It's interesting how the past, specifically the romantic poets, can matter to the present moment if you bother to read their poetry. A lot of it is beautiful. Let's see, they thought the sublime was disturbing. You know, a shadow that's ominous or eerily how the dance of the clouds can match the dance of the sea as if everything is unified so that a dramatic cloud in the sky can make a similar cloud in the mind or better still, reveal the cloud that's been there all along like a ghost, a haunting spirit in the mind Yet, by the end of a long sentence, you learn that all of this is good. <laughs> it's like a sign of God in the world or a big spirit floating around, and the wind is the very breath of God, but you have to go outside to feel it. It's pretty crazy, to be honest. I'm not sure I agree, but they believed that dreams and memories are just as real as clouds and the wind and the song of birds and holding a sleeping baby in your arms, and looking at the sky and the landscape is like reading a book or having a dream when you're awake. And all of this can happen at once because the imagination, when it's drowsy or dreamy, is the key. There's supposed to be a door between the ordinary world and the world beyond. And the dull, logical mind has fastened a lock to the door, which is why you need the imaginary key. And when you open the door, you see all of the unity and shadows and light are solemnly together. I guess it's a vision of peace. But some of the vision is always ambiguous because uncertainty is a truth you have to live with and be glad though something in living is also lonesome. And you can think about the world this way when you're alone, but then you want to tell someone about it, and that leads to writing a poem about the love and the world that's always there, lines of friendship, lines of affection, and the vision running through them like a yellow thread, or the image of something strangely yellow with green around it, a living rope dropped through the roof for us, to ring the bell of heaven. And shouldn't we be ringing now? Isn't that our conversation? This is taking longer than I had expected, so I'm going to skip, skip, <laughs> skip. <clears throat> no nap Nelly. When the child who needs to take a nap refuses to drift off peacefully, I tell her no nap Nellie, unbeknownst to either of us, has slipped into the house. From there, I embellish the tale of this often fearful, of this often tearful sprite. She might have ridden over the hill on a sunbeam to mesmerize the little girl, just as the child set dainty hands on the windowsill to toddle back and forth in a rhythm of careful humming, design that answers the larger design in front of her. The motion is how she sees the world outside, and the rhythm is the same as the swaying trees, conducted by that heralded conductor, the wind. I've told her about the wind and the trees, the soothing serenity of swaying. It's a living, symphony out there, and even a wild, unruly creature like no Nap Nelly can see it, because by love, she's part of it. In another chapter I've imagined for no Nap Nelly, she spooks a hen who, instead of laying an egg, delivers a little girl who looks exactly like no Nap Nelly. The hen is beside herself with wonder, clucking, clucking, goodness me. These are the things that fathers do. They make up tales to tell their children. I remember mine saying me a ditty in a different rhythm about a chicken. 
I had a little chick that wouldn't lay an egg, poured hot water up and down its leg. Little chick cried and the little chick begged. Little chick laid me a hard-boiled egg. <laughs> there was a time when I believed him, and I could see the chicken's leg in my mind, and I worried for the chicken. And I've mentioned this song in another poem from years ago. It's strange to have it come back, an unexpected comfort. I'm going to sing it too to someone when she's humming and has a sleepy face on her face because I love her and want her to remember. I sang to her a song I learned from my father about a chicken and she'll remember the song herself and maybe no nap Nelly will come to mind in her younger days. Two shadows. The little one belongs to her, and the taller one is mine, though I doubt she knows the shadows walking hand in hand ahead of us in the field are ours. If I walk behind her, mine, without a word, overshadows all of hers, a magic I think she likes. And when I walk at her side again, the two of us return, a giant and his little long-legged helper, who's new enough to walking still, she manages a wobble or swings a foot in picking the place to put it. None of this beautiful secret love will last. Other shadows will come along and she'll see her own one day, apart from mine. But before those fates arrive, I'm going to stretch my arms, and tipping and twirling, I'll show her how to turn her shadow into a bird and rest it softly in the tree. And afterward, when she sees a shadow, perhaps she'll think of birds or me. skipping a poem called Collards <laughs> about planting collard greens. You can probably look that up on the internet. <laughs> <clears throat> this is a longer poem and then I've got one after that and then one from the book and I'm done. Um, Snake Doctor. This is a dream in which the love residing in the world because creation is holy by design returns to everything that is or ever was even to you Marvella Hall so tall and strict my teacher in first grade who kept a rabbit in the classroom as I recall and required I sit red-faced in my little desk after some mischief of mine was found and needed punishment. Moving from shame to shame has been my life, a lot of it at least. It's something to mention, but not a complaint. You must be old indeed if you are still alive. Of course I called you Mrs. Hall, Marvella, simply suits the dream. Your first name, whatever it was, was extravagant in a country sense. I'm confident I remember that, a name I expect you came to loathe because in your lifetime and mine, the country world with all its quirks and eccentricities and its airs, now there's a word, of aspiration has fallen short and receded, although it hasn't gone away in fact. The countryside exists and people still live in the country, but the country is damaged. We both know that, Marvella. 
and being from a rural place has become in our time an embarrassment. Fidgety children is one thing, but I know adults who can't sit still. And people are afraid of silence, afraid to walk in the dark and walk in the woods to find the darkness glows. That kind of glowing is what I mean when I say love resides in the world. But you have to look for it, and your heart must open its metaphysical door, and then the love swoops in like a swallow, by which I mean the splendid bird. Swallows boiling over a field of daisies and thistles below a sky that's yellowing to glimmer at dusk. The mind approaches what this means, this scene suggesting significance beyond itself. But most of the time it trickles down below the realm of memory and drips away in the lightless cavern of consciousness. I regret, Marvella, that I've resorted to all this pretty language. Not merely a cave, but a lightless cavern of consciousness. Yet I was aware of the cavern even as a boy and learned later that part of being alive requires the cavern to grow and then you go down in it and see what's there. A misty field with swallows silhouetted against the sky, the whir of bugs, a living dream. That's where I'm coming from, Marvella. Not everybody gets it, you see. All things alive and dead and dying and rising to life. Is there a way to grasp it all, the joy, the grief, and see it all together, not as doom or fate, but intrinsic wisdom? I want this to be a happy vision. And so I will it to happiness though I'm unsteady as the guide. I made a note not long ago. With your inner eye, you're supposed to see. A notion that entered my mind after an openly symbolic dream, and I was going over it, a meditation in the dark. There was a spot in the dream, a patch of shadow like a keyhole, but it was in the air with woods around it. The shadow had something in it, something that blessed me and told me to keep my inner eye on the little patch of shadow. Remember those paintings that show the immaculate heart of Mary, Marvella? Her heart is floating in the air with religious doodads all around it, those gory, mortifying symbols. That's what this shadow made me think of. I've called this poem Snake Doctor because I found a dragonfly elegantly dead on the steps of a church I was about to enter and remembered Snake Doctor was the equally poetic word some country people used to use to name this mesmerizing bug. Unmoving now, it resembles a cross, an awkwardly disfigured cross. I'm sorry, Marvella, if you think I'm going to throw some mystical water on all of this. It isn't mine to throw, so you can put away that practical umbrella now. I wanted to make a prayer, and I did, in half sleep after the dream not for an answer, but a question. The only way I have to reach you, Marvella Hall, is through a poem. I wanted you to know that you are loved. You are loved. You are loved, you horsey old woman. <laughs> want to uh, take a moment to say happy birthday to Amy Jarman.
36 and full of tricks. <laughs> so goes, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Two more. The gospel of music. You have to thank the great beyond if your child delights in bird song, especially a chorus of it, a dizzy crowd of birds singing, warbles, chits, and caws ringing through the sanctuary of the woods. Although I heard the birds myself, it was the little one who pointed her finger to the budding trees and pronounced the word she has for music, composed of a pair of syllables both beginning vaguely with Y, with emphasis rightly on the first. It happens also to be the word she has for donkey and the, and the plural of donkey. And it's also the word she says regarding the photograph of an old time banjo player she sees at supper time. She sees the sound of a silent instrument. And that's the true gospel of music. In the beginning was the word, and the word was music, and birds, and donkeys, and God was a serious banjo player with an inscrutable face who said to everything alive, I made the world for singing. Now, you sing. Last one, the watching tree. So I went out into the blue, carrying my love dream in my bare hands like a bird, a bird I'd found alone and had to raise. And now it was time to find the tree. And we found it, me and the sweet bird. We found the tree under the blue, as if the blue had dreamed the tree to be on the hill, a watching tree, to watch the other dream. And so it saw me coming up the hill with a clutch of feathers in my hands. And the wind bent down a branch, and I set the bird in the crook. But the tree shook itself and said, get up. Get up here, too, you carrier. So I sat on the branch, and boing. The branch sprang up, and the sweet bird chirped twice and fluttered around me singing, and the other hills rose on and on, and the river returned some blue to the blue above, the bigger blue that had dreamed the watching tree on the hill. So I said, excuse me, tree, is this still my dream? And the tree swayed and said, honey, 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 there's only one.